A big belly laugh that brings tears to your eyes. <laughs> that sound when you sink a shot in air hockey. Finding a photo of your grandparents when they were young. There are certain things in life <laughs> that just make us smile. You can't help it. If you really think about it, there's all of these sort of touchstones that we all have. Like if you're having a bad day, go listen to this song, go watch this movie, go read this book, you know, think about this thing from a long time ago. One of my favorite things is like the pile of coats on top of the bed. It was just such a visceral memory for me as a child. As COVID-19 shut down the world, Todd Dowdy decided we all needed to be reminded and sometimes introduced to these joyful things, like the song by the Goat Rodeo Sessions that's been playing since the beginning of this video. So he started what he called Happy Making Things in a Difficult World on his Instagram feed. We were so isolated at that time and then what would happen is just like people would add their own thoughts to it and it was like oh I, have, I didn't think of that or why didn't I think of that or that's a good one and you know it was sort of this communal experience in isolation if that yeah. makes any sense. Today those original Instagram lists are combined with mixtape suggestions, heartwarming essays, encouraging quotes, suggestions for things to do today and more than 40 new happy making entries to create little pieces of hope a book with more than 3,000 items to make you smile. These are just a couple of postcards. There's Ella Fitzgerald and Matt LeBlanc, both made it into the book. A self-proclaimed pack rat, Todd Dowdy talks about the inspirations for his book's content, including his Midwestern roots. I've got my shirt on. Um, I went to SIU Carbondale. I uh, don't think that I didn't dress up for this. It was a, it was a chosen, you know, attire. Um, yeah, I am a proud Saluki. Plus, we talk about the book's essay that will have you re-watching a Christmas classic through different eyes. I'm not kidding, it becomes a different movie. Like his book, it's a conversation with a positive message. What I hope now is that people can read this, they can start making their own list, they can start listening to the playlist, they can pass along their little piece of hope to somebody else, you know, like just kind of get that little burst of happiness. Todd Dowdy, thank you so much for joining First Person One on One. Thank you for having me. I have to say um, a huge shout out to Carrie Robb and everybody at the library. I can't believe that I'm here and I'm just thrilled to be here. Where are you joining us from today? So I am sitting on the living room uh, floor in our <laughs> on the apartment. Floor. <laughs> yeah. In our apartment, we're uh, just outside of New York City. Um, and after we talk, I'll be heading into the office today. We'll start at the beginning, I guess. Sure. How did Little Pieces of Hope begin for you? So we can blame this squarely on the shoulders of Metro North, which is our uh, commuter rail here, because on Wednesday, March 11th, um, the WHO declared a global pandemic. And I, for some reason, just popped into my head um, that day, I'm gonna make a list of happy making things. You know, at that point, Things were changing kind of rapidly. Our offices shut down on Friday the 13th uh, of March, and we just went back this past September. But anyway, on the train home, I started thinking about things that have brought me joy in life. Um, and that was everything from New York City to Fat Goldfish to uh, Catherine Hepburn's entrance in The Lion in Winter. And it became this little short list of a bunch of different things. Um, people seemed to respond really well. It was on my Instagram. And then the next day I just kept going and going and going. Um, and you know, here we are today. Um, I didn't expect it to become a book. That really wasn't the goal in mind when I started that first list. It was kind of, I just wanted something that was happy and joyful that could kind of ground me in a really strange time, you know, and I think that one of the things about the book is 
you know, a friend of mine says that everybody's carrying around an invisible bag of rocks. Like we don't know how much it weighs for that person. And what my hope was for that first list and now this book is that whether it's a regular battle day or it's an unprecedented or scary time in your life um, that you can pick this up and just kind of get that little burst of happiness. Lighten that load a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's the goal. I was wondering about that. What kind of catalog you have in your head? Because I mean, there's some wonderfully obscure things um, that I found, you know, I'd, I'd finished reading a, a list and then Google, I was, I was constantly Googling things. Was, was that your hope? Yeah, that's great to hear. That's really exciting to me um, because, you know, there's this very thin line between memory and discovery. So some of the things are, I'm a pack rat, you know, there are things that I've held on to a long time, be it an article, postcard, a letter, a memory, whatever, or during this unprecedented time, kind of just going through and finding things down various rabbit holes um, that's really awesome to hear. And, you know, one of the things that I said at the very beginning is there may be things on the list that you don't know that if we, you know, discover them together or there's, you know, that um, moment that sparks you to take a look, that's an amazing connection between us. Conversely, if there are things on the list that you don't like, I even say, get out your pen, exit through and add your own little piece of hope. You also write about your grandparents and what really touched me was, you know, how you say that all life's little things add value to your life. And you forget that sometimes. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about Walter and Vivian Vaughn and, and explaining how they helped inspire the book as well? Sure. I, I will happily do that. I will try not to get for um, <laughs> uh, So the book is dedicated to my mom and her parents and her grandmother and also to my partner, Randy, and his mother. And when you read the book, you'll see, in addition to all these dozens of lists, and I've added new ones that have not been published before, I did around 16 different essays. And it's everything from small towns, which I grew up in, to taking the leap, that painting that I love in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, that song that got you through a breakup. And the last essay is called The Things That Last. So when my mom was young, she was five, her parents died due to a car accident. And when they told her grandmother, she died immediately on the spot as well. So as you'll note in the dedication, it's um, May 30th, 1960, I gave their dates in there. So the thing that this relates to, and I know this starts off a little bit rocky, as I say in the book, um, you know, there are all these things, whether it's a painting or a TV show or a movie or a feeling or a memory or a recipe, um, that have lasted. And that's why they're here in the book. You know, we all have these touchstones in life. And in relation to my grandparents and my mother, the thing that lasted was love. Um, she only had them for a short amount of time. You know, I, of course, did not know them. And as I write in the book, I'd actually never even been to their grave before um, until one summer a few years ago. And it was a very beautiful and strange full circle moment because what I realized was love begets more love. So they must have loved my mother very deeply because I feel it very deeply from her, my sisters and I. Um, and that was the connection. Um, oddly as well, we were at the cemetery. My uncle Dennis, who is the genealogist on my dad's side, he knew the exact little road that we had to take to the country church to get there. Again, I'd never been. It was a sweltering summer day. We traipsed around the cemetery, we couldn't find them. And then we got in the car to go to Dairy Queen to kind of cool off. And I turned on the air conditioner and I looked out the window and they were literally, the, their grave was right next to the car. And I said to Dennis, you know, we were just about to leave. And he said they were calling out to you. Um, so in a, in a strange moment of kismet, this book starts on a train, ends in a car, looking out the window and kind of remembering the good things that are in your life. Chris Bojallion, who is an author who we've had on First Person One-on-One, -on -one, and yeah. he called you the comforter in chief. <laughs> <laughs> I told what him an... he needed to get me that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems perfect because yes, you read well, these and you do get a warm feeling. I mean, how, how do you feel about that title? I mean, that's awesome. Like you can't ask for anything better. Um, 
you know, Chris is amazing and he was a cheerleader from the beginning. And what was really interesting when this whole thing started was to watch the comments in kind of the Instagram posts of people bringing up their own things. And I think like, oh, that's a good one. You know, look, I'm no expert, I'm no genius, but I think that everybody can use that little pick me up. And if you, you know, are flipping through this book one day, you don't have to read it all the way through, you can dip in, dip in and out um, and find that kind of moment where you just take a beat, take a breath, remember something good, then that makes me really happy. Well, it is fun if you if you do read it from beginning to end to look for how many times Lin Manuel Miranda is in this book. <laughs> yes, he's in there a couple of times. Jacqueline Onassis is in there a couple of times. The Adams family is in there. Um, there are definite uh, key pieces of art or people that I go back to in my life. But yeah. I think we all do that, you know. I was wondering if any of those people jumped onto your list. Did any of these, those people see your lists and comment? Not as of yet. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, you know, it may, may reach a few people, which would be great. Lin-Manuel, if you're listening, <laughs> we're, we're ready for a note. Exactly. Add, add in your, your happy moments, right? There we go. Yeah, I noticed that also there, uh, like the Barefoot Contessa, several yeah. of her recipes. So are, are you a big cook? Cause I noticed there's some of hers or some Martha Stewart. Absolutely not. That I, I am a good <laughs> chopper. I'm a good grocery carrier. I am a terrible cook. Uh, but Randy is the cook. We have all the Barefoot Contessa cookbooks. Uh, we go back to her weeknight bolognese a lot. Um, you know, they're just, I mean, well, I, I really can't speak to this from experience because again, I'm just chopping things, but they're kind of <laughs> easy and great and wonderful to do. Uh, but yes, there is, she's in there a lot. Smitten Kitchen is in there. Um, there are a few things that I pulled out for the reader, just if you need it, you know, kind of a cozy recipe for home. You will find, at least for me, I found that I was making lists from the list of things that I wanted oh, to remember to do. Like, yeah, to make, like, well, I want to make that recipe and I want to <laughs> listen to that song more. And books, if you're looking for book suggestions, you have so many, and, and I've started reading some of your suggestions and they're all phenomenal. Oh, thank Just you. Just spot on. I've enjoyed every one that you've suggested. And it makes sense though, because of your background, you were a bookseller. Yeah, I was really lucky. Um, when I was at SIU, I worked at Books A Million for a couple of years. And then I worked at Walden Books all through college. Um, books have been a really important part of my personal life and my professional life. Um, you know, at SIU, we graduated on a Friday. Um, I my, one of my college roommates and I, my best friend, we drove out to New York the following Monday and lived in a youth hostel for two weeks. And then I got a job at Walden Books on Wall Street downtown for about three years. And one day a friend of mine, um, she said, you know, you can talk to a wall and you read everything. There is this publicity assistant opening at Random House and I bet you'd be really good at it. And I was like, okay. I had no clue as to what publicity was. I'd never worked in an office before. Um, I somehow managed to convince these people to let me in and work there. And that's where I started in the summer of 1998. And for the past 16 years, I have been at Doubleday, uh, which has just been an awesome way to spend your professional life. I mean, uh, publicity is the caboose of the publishing train, is what I say. Um, you know, we are the folks who arrange all of the author events with amazing people like Carrie Robb and the St. Louis County Public Library. Um, <clears throat> we also arrange, you know, if you hear an author on NPR or see them on TV or read something online, like we're trying to get as much publicity for that author and their book as possible. Um, and it's been, you know, for a book nerd like me from a small town that went to the library almost every day during the summer, like it's just been awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's just no other way to describe it. I'm, I'm very, very lucky and I know it. So what's it like for you to be on the other side of it? It's amazing and weird and <laughs> surreal. And the fact it is not lost on me to the fact that any of this has happened and that this little book exists is it's a miracle. You know, um, the Penguin team has been incredible. Um, but yeah, I'm used to being behind the scenes. Like this is kind <laughs> of you know, not my gig. Well, and you even have a memento there that kind of inspired something too, right? Show, yeah. show that to, 
So this is where professional and personal blends. So this is an actual feather from the Big Bird puppet um, that Carol Spinney, the amazing artist, puppeteer, human being, uh, his wife, Debbie, gave to me. So how that story unfolds is I was a Sesame Street kid. You'll see Sesame Street and Jim Henson throughout the book as well, different parts of it. Um, you know, I, who wasn't in the 70s, but I, I was a huge Sesame Street nut. Um, and all these years later, I believe it was 2003, we published Carol Spinney's autobiography, The Wisdom of Big Bird. And I was his publicist. So that was just absolutely insane the first time that I met him. It was a day we had booked CBS Sunday morning, again, publicist. Um, we had an interview scheduled and they wanted to go shoot on the Sesame Street set. So I was like, I am going to this. And we <laughs> went out to the studio in Queens and it was the last day that they were filming for the year. And Carol and his amazing wife, Debbie, were there. Um, Debbie led me through the set and I was literally walking along Sesame Street past Hooper's store, down in front of the Brownstones, Oscar's trash can. Snuffle Uppicus was there, the, the other Muppets were there. And I looked at her and I said, this is like having your childhood come to life in front of you. So. We sit down in the chairs and we're watching Carol do a scene and he's in the puppet and you know he uses his hand to move the bird's beak. And as he's doing the scene, this feather falls off the back of his tail and it lands on the street and Debbie runs out there to get it. And she then turned over and handed it to me and said, I think you should have this. We actually became very friendly with them, um, would have dinner sometimes and he was just, the most amazing talent and, and human being. And even though he's a legend, he was a legend. He was so interested in you and other people and, and just kind of everything around him. It was, it was a magical experience. And again, I, 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 know, I know how lucky I am. There are a lot of locations mentioned in the book that have you Googling, you know, sunsets from this location or sunrises from here. But for those people from this area in St. Louis, there are a lot of little St. Louis things too, like the Stan Musial Bridge and Main Street St. Charles. Home is important to me. You can take the boy out of the Midwest, but you can't take the Midwest out of the boy is what I like to say. Um, coming back home every time, it's just been, I've lived there and I've lived here. Those are the only two places I've ever lived in my life. Most of my family is all still in the area. Um, my siblings are all in the area, all four of them. Um, you know, and I think for anyone that where you come from is an important thing, right? I mean, it, it shapes you one way or another. Um, the first essay I believe in the book is all about small towns. I think, you know, John Cougar Mellencamp got it right when he sang about it. You know, I think that it shaped me to this day. The essays in this book really get you thinking. I mean, I will be watching It's a Wonderful Life much differently <laughs> than I have in the past. Thanks, thanks to an article you have about Mary Bailey. Everybody looks at that movie and you think like George is the hero and to some extent, sure. But it's Mary when you really start to watch it, that's kind of behind the scenes sort of moving everything along, be it from, you know, she's the one that places the call to Uncle Billy at the very end. She's the one that um, renovates the house. She's the one that saves the savings and loan. And I think to kind of look at somebody who, yes, she's a main character, but she's the driving force behind that. I think we've all known somebody like that in our life. I even name a few people in my own life that have been like Mary Bailey, uh, our neighbor, Pat Broadbent, um, my mom, my stepmom, Patty, um, you know, my best friend's mom, Pam Finley. I think everybody has a Mary Bailey in their life. And I think that she's a pretty darn good real model. Todd, what's next for you? Do you see another book in your future? Um, it would be great if we could. If not, I again know that this is such a miracle that it's happened. Uh, I'm grateful. I've kept on doing the list since I turned in the book last year. Um, so there's still, you know, many, many more things to discover. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just kind of was just taking it one day at a time. <laughs> Do you ever think about what you would have told yourself as a kid about like where you are now? Like what would you have told yourself? 
way back when? Um, I think there are a couple of key things that really stick out to me is like, you know, I came to New York City when I was 16 on a church trip. We were with the Methodist, our Methodist church. We came out on a trip and I fell in love with the city and I came back home and I told my mom that I was going to move there. And she's like, that's great. You can do it after college. So I did. And again, I cannot adequately say how lucky I have been to be in publishing. You know, um, I remember reading Prince of Tides in college and then all these years later, I got to work with Pat Conroy. You know, when my roommates and I were in college, there was this guy who wrote this book that became this huge bestseller about, you know, this, this new lawyer that works at a corrupt firm. It was John Grisham's The Firm. We devoured that book. We then devoured everything else that John wrote. And at that time, I actually wrote him a fan letter. And he wrote back to me. And now 30 years later, to be working with him as his publicist, I mean, it's just a remarkable, remarkable thing. Absolutely. This has been a lot of fun talking with you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I was thrilled to be here. I appreciate you reading the book and I appreciate Carrie and everybody uh, hosting me tonight. Yes. And if you want to get your copy of Little Pieces of Hope, you can find those at Left Bank Books. It will bring you joy for sure and, and make you think about things you haven't thought about in quite some time. Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you. Happy making things in a difficult world. NYC, fat goldfish, a really good burger, long walks, your foot sticking out from under a blanket in order to find some cool air, the music intro to NPR's All Things Considered, short naps, Times Square late at night in the rain, Sondheim, someone forgiving you, someone believing in you, a really bad DJ at a wedding that turning into a really good DJ at a wedding, Stephen King's Twitter, Twin Peaks season one still holds up, college basketball, an unexpected phone call or text from someone you haven't talked to in a while but just thought of moments before, an old gray muzzled dog with happy eyes, any movie of Catherine Hepburn's, especially her entrance in The Lion in Winter, a small piece of chocolate that leaves you wanting more, Ella Fitzgerald's version of Irving Berlin's Blue Skies, a long road trip on a crisp fall day when the leaves are just post peak and there's a scent of wood smoke in the air. An extremely green grasshopper. Lynn Manuel Miranda. The whistle of a train. Katherine Johnson. Newly sharpened pencils. Civility. Bacon. Eudora Welty's One Rider's Beginnings. Freshly cut yellow tulips. Calabot's Paris Street Rainy Day. The trip home. E.L. Konigsberg's from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basilie Frankweiler.